it's an honor to be here. Um, I've had, <clears throat> excuse me, I've had a, the opportunity to know <clears throat> Dr. Salvatera for quite a while. Um, when I was becoming the president of UNOS, he came by and grabbed me up at the Fairmont, <clears throat> excuse me, and said, what do you know about UNOS? And I said, it's the organization that I'm the president of in a, a year or two. And he said, no, what do you know about it? And he said, do you want to know more? And, he, and I said, yes, of course. And I went back to Virginia. And in a, I can't remember how long it was, a couple of weeks. I sort of even forgot about it. A box arrives. And the box contained transcripts, copies of all the different things that went into NOTA. And his generosity has, was something which I found to be amazing. Um, it's always been a pleasure to, to have him around and to, and to get to get to know him and to get his insight, because he has a tremendous amount of, uh, uh, of both experience and wisdom going through. But anyway, this is about him. <clears throat> and it's about, <clears throat> excuse me, the legacy of what he has left us. Um, so faculty at Stanford and UCSF, a founding member of the American Society of Transplant Surgeons. He was on the initial nominating committee for the ASTS, so president in 1983 to 84, and this will become really important when you start looking at the timeline and we start talking about things. <clears throat> he was the second president of UNOS, the OPTN, a pioneer award, incredible number of contributions. But the most important part is, and it, I think it's really key, is he's a really good guy. Um, and so what I want to talk about today is, is lessons that we learned uh, from the history of transplantation and the canary in the coal mine. And the, oops, excuse me. The intent is to say that every good idea needs maintenance to achieve its goal. Um, I think it's going to be a really important thing as we go through to talk about maintenance and keeping an eye on, the, on what the goal is. We're going to talk about the reasons that one looks at specific outcomes in healthcare, discuss the unintended consequences of seeing what you look at rather than potentially what you need to see, uh, with an emphasis on transparency, accountability, and responsible, responsiveness, and hopefully to discuss a way to get out of the mine before all the miners die. So the notion of a sentinel species has been something which has always been in, the, in, the, uh, in, in, our, in our dialogue, and it's a way to assess a changing environment. And a sentinel species are basically a warning system. The canaries turned out to be more susceptible to carbon monoxide and other toxic gases than, uh, than humans, so that if, when the canary healed over, the miners could either get out uh, respirators or get out of the mine before um, the, the the, the truly outrageous things happen to them. But there are other ones which are there. There's a dancing cat fever uh, in Japan for mercury toxicity, uh, that was, which was in the bay, so that the, when the cats got crazy, people knew to stop fishing quite as much as they were. Rabbits had been used in sarin gas um, uh, plants looking for leaks. Uh, they were obviously more susceptible than humans. The frogs uh, in our neck of the woods, the frog on the other one is the presence of either acid rain or chemical pollutants in the water system, and is transplant a sentinel species in terms of system effects in our current era of um, reporting and transparency? So guess what? Living in a glass house will change the way you work um, and the way you perceive other people to do it. This is um, uh, the, the glass house in, in New Canaan, Connecticut. Um, and the rationale as to why we currently live in a glass house and why the rest of healthcare is going to be moving towards a glass house is part of the story that we want to talk about today. It's him, <laughs> and it's all of you, and it's me um, as to where we go. So let's just step back in time a bit. Transplantation was a dream. Replacing a diseased organ with, um, with a healthy organ has always been a surgeon's dream. And down here on the uh, lower right, you can see St. Uh, Cosmos and Damien replacing the, the leg of the moor, um, uh, replacing the leg of the, the, the man with, a, with the leg of a moor, uh, and he miraculously got better after the gangrene was there. But it also can create nightmares, um, and the nightmares have been in lots of different components of where health care has, has been afraid, death, hope grave robbing, all sorts of different things is where we have to have a lot of uh, oversight and, and jurisdiction. The technical aspects of what would make transplantation feasible uh, occurred in the early part of the 1900s and up to the mid portion. The technical sides were essentially done by Alexis Carell, 
and the scientific underpinnings of at least understanding the immune response to somebody else was, um, came out of uh, Medawar and Billingham and a bunch of other people with it the big, it through the Second World War. So that the underpinnings were there, the technical side was there, and then the ver first successful uh, human kidney transplant was occurred in 1954 under, uh, out in Boston. And this led to the expansion of the notion that we could, we could do this thing of replacing organs um, and have people live more healthy lives. So after the first transplant in 54, in the 60s, people started pushing all sorts of limits. I mean, they, the first liver, heart, pancreas were all tried and they sort of succeeded. There were some things which we needed to do, but the kidneys were able to keep on going. And by the time the 70s came around, we went 15 years, a little bit more, there was a lot of push uh, to use transplantation effectively for people. So in 1972, the End Stage Renal Disease Act was passed, which just basically said, and you'll find that no other End Stage Organ Disease Act has been passed since then, um, because this has been really expensive for the government that everybody who with kidney failure in the country was entitled to treatment. They, we weren't gonna let people die from kidney failure. Um, this has turned out to be an extraordinarily expensive proposition um, for the handful of people who are on uh, dialysis. We spend, I believe it's 2% of the Medicare budget taking care of those half a million people. Um, it's, a, it's a phenomenal uh, amount of money. The AST, so that, was, that happened in 1972. The ASTS was formed in 1974. Uh, in 1975, at the first address which came through, uh, Dr. Starzl cautioned against the society about just focusing on kidneys. I mean, that was the major aspect that was clinically available back in that time. But he said, you know, that it will happen that we can transplant hearts and lungs and livers and there will be a number of other things we need to do. We needed to think big. At the time back in the early, in, in the mid 70s, all of everything which was done in transplantation was controlled by the hospital which was doing it. Organ availability, going out and getting organs, taking them back, putting them in, finding the right recipient for it was all the responsibility of the hospital or the transplanting surgeon, the transplanting <coughs> team which was, which was doing it. And you can imagine, just maybe you can imagine that there might be some conflict between the people who were going out and getting the organs and putting them into people and then maybe not wanting to share with other people, um, their competitors down the road. So if you were in Stanford and you had an organ donor, maybe you wouldn't share it with the guys up at UCSF. Maybe you'd send it to somebody else if you weren't gonna use it or not use it at all. It turns out under that circumstance, that the organs were not used very efficiently at all. A lot of them were shipped overseas. There was this huge um, time back in, the <clears throat> back in the 70s and actually early 80s as well in which organs were shipped to the Middle East. Um, so I believe there was out of the organs which were retrieved, certainly in my old neck of the woods in, in Virginia, about 35% of the organs which were not used were all shipped over, overseas and they weren't used locally at all. It was remarkably inefficient. Oftentimes, if we didn't have a, a liver program at our place and there was a liver available, well, we'll just take the kidneys because that's what we can use. We're not gonna share the liver. And there was a rear, huge inefficiency in this system. And people started squawking. And because it was not routinely recognized yet, people weren't routinely paying for it. There was changes of access to care. There was misery. Reagan and the AMA wanted the private sector to solve the discrepancies and it was just going on and on. And then in 1982, there was, a, there was something that happened which kind of triggered it off. And this is out of a story in Time Magazine. The big guy there is Dr. Nigerian. He's my old boss, sort of Dr. Salvatierra's old friend from UCSF days. And he is, um, <clears throat> he's a big guy. And there was a little kid who was out in the Northeast named Jamie Fisk, and she had biliary atresia, and she needed a new liver. And there was no good system to get that liver. But her father happened to be a hospital administrator, and hospital administrators know how to network, if you will. And so he, <clears throat> he telegraphed 500 pediatricians. He sent a newsletter to 1,000 hospitals. 
Uh, the American Academy of Pediatrics had their annual meeting and he got up and made an announcement about his child's need. He got on the horn and he figured out how to get to Dan Rather, Ted Kennedy, Tip O'Neill, and even the president himself to make a national appeal for an organ for his daughter. The response was pretty amazing. I was a resident back at that time. We got lots of phone calls. Um, over 500 calls came to Minnesota. Eventually, there was a, almost a perfect size match organ from a, a little kid out in Utah. And they direct donated the organ to, um, to Jamie Fisk. And that raised a bunch of questions. They raised the questions of why don't other people have the access to donated organs as this child did? Why is there such a disparity in access? Could it be minimized? And what the heck is going on? Why is it that somebody of influence gets an organ and somebody who's just a regular Joe dies? And that was right at the time when the good Dr. Salvatierra became president of the ASTS. So there was a big push to make it a better system. And the first one was just to talk about it. And so they, had, they set up a task force and it started out in the House, then it went to the Senate. But it basically talked about a bunch of different issues. One, it talked about organ procurement and transplantation. But it also talked about money. And it talked about reimbursement. And it put into whole perspective the continuum of care as to how things actually function or needed to function in order to make for a better system in the United States. The first thing was recognize that we didn't have enough organs. Even back in, 19, in, in the early 80s, there were not enough organs to take care of the people who, who had need. The patients on the uh, waiting for donor organs were surprisingly at a risk of death. And it was important to uh, recognize that we were, we were all under a clock of time for um, taking care of, of these folks. There was an absence of an effective national network to solicit and identify match organ donors with patients and that where people were forced to go to public appeals, maybe like today onto Facebook or trying to do other things, we're kind of degenerating back into a similar system. Their cooperative relationships between an informed public and a receptive medical community was necessary, um, and that disagreements, surprisingly, there were even disagreements back then between the insurance community and the medical community concerning reimbursement, led to inequitable treatment and potential denial of very needed care. And if you look through the transcripts, there was repetitive notions of the things which make us unique, the things which make our, what we do, a profession and not just a task. There was a commitment to altruism, professionalism, honesty, skill, knowledge, duty, loyalty, and fraternity to peers. All the things which make our, uh, our effort uh, something which is uh, truly unique. Anyway, the long and short of it was afterwards with the, the good leadership of, of, of several within the community, uh, most importantly being our current honoree, was to identify all the people that would make a benefit in the country. In other words, make a list of people. And then to organize that list based on need, set up a system that we could distribute available organs equitably, not efficiently, not justly, equitably, whatever that particularly means. It's actually a very interesting problem. But then to maximize the donation gift and establish a process independent of the centers to optimize organ retrieval. In other words, create this big network of organ retrieval systems that we currently have. And so there was a partnership between this guy who brought us the internet and the transplant community to come up with a system, and we did. I mean, that was what, what Dr. <coughs> Esquivel was, was talking about, was NOTA in 1984. Um, it was the authority for transplantation in the country. Um, it's different than, we do it differently than they do it in Europe, the way it's done in South America, in Australia. Every country has its own little twist on how they validate the idea of taking something of great value an or a human organ, and moving it from one person to another. What kind of internal systems are necessary to support it? What kind of financial resources? How are you going to organize it? All those things are really very unique. And, but this was the thing which did it for us. It created our OPO system with a one-time grant from CMS, which has turned out to be a big problem for us in the few, going past, because it bifurcates donation and transplantation. It created the Oregon Procurement and Transplant Network, which is the part of the business which, which makes the system 
function, if you will. It standardizes listing criteria, standardizes urgent criteria, it, is, it uh, mandates the effective use of donated organs, it makes the membership criteria. But we're going to talk about a lot today in the era of transparency of these two last, these two things here. Collect and analyze data regarding allocation and transplantation and make that data available to the public. Great idea. It is not a bad idea. There are just consequences if you don't do it right, wrong, or indifferent. And we need to go back to the general goal. The goal is to make a really functioning system. And then they said at the end that buying and selling organs for transplantation is a felony. It's against the law. It's got lots of consequences to it. So the whole notion of where we keep talking about lack of availability in this, in the United States, we think the market can solve all of our problems. And we're looking at lots of different ways to try to get more effort into it. And we think if we put money into it, we may get it. But inside of the law, created by him, um, or helped by him, uh, it is, it is a, frankly a felony to give um, valuable consideration uh, for that effort. So UNOS, which was the stepchild of an or, old organization in the South, um, bid on the contract and they've had it ever since. And, but the important part was nothing was enforceable until the government actually said this is enforceable. And that means there has to be a final rule. And they went for 15 years without having a final rule. But it came. And when it came in 2000, it did all sorts of things. It had it reconfigured and defined what the board of directors was, what membership was, what designated transplant requirements were, that the OPTN had to have policies and they had to review those policies and enforce those policies. Now, it was by peer review, but it had to be, they had to be enforced and the program's members had to adhere to it. And they still talked about data collection and reporting and that was still a major part of what happened. And then it created the ACOT. This put teeth into the business of what we do. We don't have any choice now but to do this. There is, teeth, there is teeth in oversight. At the same time that all this was happening in transplant, this was happening in general health care. There were two, two manuscripts that came out from the IOM. One was to Air as Human in 1999, and the second one was Crossing the Quality Chasm, the new health care system for the 21st century. There was talk at this time and the repetitive emphasis to push, push, and push um, transparency of care and data, all of which is, there's a rationale for why it does. And so that the National Quality Forum, which went on, was talking about honest, non-punitive reporting, transparency in care and data, informed, satisfied patients, actually that things go well, there's no injury, that everything is great, and they wanted to have a culture obsessed with safety. No good deed will ever go unpunished. Now, it's unclear who's, who basically said that, whether it was Claire Luce Booth or Oscar Wilde, so I'm going to give them both credit. Um, uh, but it, the basic point is, is that a good deed and a good idea needs to be maintained. It will go punished by lots of different folks who go, go awry. And so the system information system, the transparency component, which was fundamental to NOTA, um, had a variety of different things. One is, Everybody has to report their data. That's the only thing in the initial law which was actually enforced. The transplant programs had to tell the government everything that happened about their patient. And if you didn't do it, you were at risk of not being a member of the OPTN. And if you're not a member of the OPTN, you don't get to transplant any organs. So it was a sustainability function which went through. UNOS was the initial one until the final rule came by. They were the SRTR and the OPTN. That was truly the fox guarding the chicken house. And everybody thought that was a really bad idea. So after then, it was given to an outside group. Um, it, I, I, the University of Michigan had it for a while, and currently uh, we have it up in uh, Minnesota. The SRTR, there, there's several things which are really important about the SRTR. They're supposed to do two things. One is to provide an analyst and data for the secretary to say this system works or doesn't work. It's, so it's an internal function to say this is a good thing that we are doing, we're meeting our goals, we're analyzing things. And so it's, that's the first part which goes through. It is for the oversight of the transplant system to verify that the allocation system works and it's done in a risk adjusted manner so that everybody feels that they're not getting overly disadvantaged in the system. Um, but it looks system it's supposed to look systematically for areas that need process improvements. It's supposed to look into the system and say, we can do it, we're doing it pretty well here, but we need to do it a little better over there. 
doesn't always work that way, but that is the overall premise. And it's supposed to also look parenthetically at the cost of providing transplant care for the community. And it really has not done that at all. But the other function that it was supposed to do was to give information for patients, for family, and physicians to help them select which transplant center they wanted to use. So there was a public disclosure which would say, well, I have these several opportunities for transplantation, which one best fits my needs? And there was supposed to be a information release for that purpose. Now, we use a lot of comparative data to do stuff. And this is just taken off one of the betting uh, charts about how the Cleveland Browns are risk adjusted, maybe not to be the best team in the world, but that, that we do risk adjustment to try to figure out which team to bet on. And we, if you want to choose a transplant center, which one do you want to use? So there, we take a concept and to put it into language. And it's, so it's part of our culture to do this. So doing it with transplant programs is not totally out of the realm of possibility. It's what we do. But this is what's in the data. We count dead bodies. We talk about patient and graft survival. We talk about a little bit about activity as to how many people go charging up the hill. But this may not be the right thing that people need to know in order to deal with, um, with, with choice of a selection for a, a program. Um, but it's all what's currently written, and it's all released, and it's all reported every six months on the web. And it's this type of information that can be used for all sorts of different things. And so this is just a screenshot of the, of the web page for, um, for the SRTR. And any one of you can go onto it. It's srtr.org. And you can find out how the uh, Stanford University does for any organ that they transplant. You can find out how we do at the University of Minnesota. Anybody else you want to know, you can find out what they do. It's right there. And what's the effect of this? So if you can see, if you're at St. John Medical Center up there at the top, you end up with that little blue box that says you're better than expected. It's a whole lot different than if you go to the University of California, Davis, which you are as expected. And, but let's just look at the difference. So you have 43 guys over two and a half years that get transplanted at a better than expected, and 394 which get transplanted as an as expected. Which one is really the better? You know, if you just look at the total things, how does this happen? Well, what happens when you're better than expected, everybody plods themselves, pat themselves on the back. You get it up and you, you use it as an advertising thing. It puts out on the, you get a little banner. The CEO loves you. You, you can get probably a little more attention from your payers to say, look, look how efficient and good we are. Um, it's really important. The big important part is the, the people like Optum, the United Health, the biggest health insurer in the country, they use this data to select their centers of excellence. If you don't fit into their expected outcomes, you're never going to be an expect, you're never going to be a center of excellence. And so there are huge financial consequences to this transparent this transparent data that comes out. And I'm not going to go into how we risk adjust and how they come up with it, but it's not a very accurate system in which we go through. But what do you think happens when you get this one and you end up being the one that's on the left that says you're worse than expected? What happens for a worse than expected program? Well, when you're bad, man, you get beat. <laughs> there are public, when the public report comes out, and there are, they're used by lots of things. The first thing they're used for is the, is the insurers. They look at it. If you're worse than expected, you're not going to be in the center of excellence. How can they possibly make a program which is worse than expected a excellent center? You're out. Access to care, money, funding, it's gone. Medicare, if you do it two out of five times, they're a little bit more gracious than, than are the, uh, uh, the insurers. You have, to, you have to go up and do your mea culpa in front of Medicare. No hospital system in this country can afford to function without Medicare coverage. It's not going to happen. The mitigating factor approach for or a system improvement action that goes through with Medicare, it's estimated to cost at least a million dollars to a hospital to get out of, out, of, uh, uh, out of SRTR hell. It is a very, very expensive process. The cost of just going into uh, uh, worse than expected is, is not quite as much as the cost for Medicare, but it's seriously hundreds of thousands of dollars to get, get yourself out of this thing. People who don't like it, CEO of your hospital system. 
they do not like having to explain to the community and the press as to why they're one of the programs in their, their system is worse than expected. Anyway, so living in a glass house, it changes the way you live. You start changing your clothes differently. Um, you, you, you know that there are people watching you. There are things that happen that you would never ever do if you knew that you could actually pull the blinds and things were, were safe. So human behaviors change when you're told you're below, effect, below expected. One of the things that this, is, this has been known for is, is this year's Nobel laureate in economics. Um, I mean, the good Dr. Thaler has talked about behavioral economics as a driving factor on how we, how we function in, in, in everything that we do, and that we're not necessarily always rational, that we act in a much more um, uh, visceral type response to making economic decisions. The two things that I want to talk about this is that honey draws more flies than vinegar, and you got to measure the right things to get the system that you want. Our current environment is more punitive than it is uh, 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 laudatory. Uh, the monetary loss associated with flagging, the negative press, the, the, everything is, is leaned towards the stick part of the system rather than the carrot part. Uh, we have a lot of oversight agencies with our here, which are inconsistent with each other, whether it's JCO, whether it's CMS, whether it's OPTN. We can go through all of them, they, but there are inconsistencies in the way that we, we go forward. And the measuring the right things is actually the really hard part of this whole system. And we're gonna talk a little bit about that going forward, but having programs compete, compete amongst themselves when results are really good doesn't make a whole lot of sense for a system. It may be really good for sports teams and a variety of others, but maybe not in a healthcare system. So behavior change to stimuli is real. The impact of transparency, I want to use a case study and just completely get out of transplant for a second. Um, the New York State of, uh, Department of Health began collecting data on heart surgery back in 1989 with the intent, three purposes, provide hospital information to improve quality of care, assist the Department of Health for quality improvement, and provide consumers with information to help them choose. Sounds very akin to what NOTA was about and how we did it. And then they publicly released the information on volume, crude, and risk-adjusted mortality rates. Somebody sued for surgeon-specific information in 1901, and that started to be released. Um, so 89 to 92, when this started to go into a public release, they saw a 31% increase in the number of cabbages. The average severity of increase, the severity of illness went up, so they were not intrinsically doing less um, they, were, they were doing sicker people, and hospital mortality decreased 21%. There was a 41% decline in the risk-adjusted mortality. Transparency of the information was declared a successful model for all healthcare systems. The Department of Health planned to expand it to assess non-fatal complications and other diseases and to replicate it in, in many ways. This was a success. And then the Cleveland Clinics looked at their whole data system and they said, let's look at what happened to us during the era when they gave public dissemination um, out of New York. And they looked at their four-year model of, of, of patients that came from different places and they saw that they had a very substantial increase in the number of folks who came from New York, which is the white bar. Um, and it was out of proportion to what they saw in other, from other states. And then they went and they looked at the mortality rates of where people would come from, from either in Ohio or from out of state. And they saw that the people from New York were pretty darn sick. And they were dying at a much higher rate than were the folks from, from Ohio or the other states or anything else. And the impact on the cardiac surgery in Cleveland was real. Their referrals from New York went up 57% after public release of information came out. Referrals from Ohio decreased 5%. Referrals from other states decreased to almost 50%. Referrals internationally increased a little bit. But the people who came from New York were actually the ones who were gonna look pretty bad on a, on a public release of information. They were sicker, they had a New York Heart Association class three or four, and they had a much higher expected mortality rate. So the guys from New York got smart, and they knew if it was gonna be publicly released, they were just gonna refer them out to somebody else who would do them. 
Now the real impact was even worse than this. I mean, it, it changed the demographics of the people who were offered care. So this is just to show the number, the relative percentage of the different demographics. And long and short is fewer, fewer blacks and Hispanics and people of color got, got cardiac surgery after the public release of information than before. And it took a full, what is that, eight years for it to renormalize and to come back down. Eventually it did, so that the care started to become renormalized re in the system. But there was a huge impact upon access to care and who could get access to care and what in the world all of this meant to the care delivery. And if you looked at, this was from the New England Journal back in 96, um, again, the influence of performance reports on referral and access to care, they, they looked at two groups, one cardiac surgeons, the other cardiologists. And if you look at the cardiac surgeons, a full 67% said they declined, whoops, excuse me, they declined to operate on at least one person because of the public release of information over the, the period of time. But there were a lot more. There, there was 18% or 35% um, said they were much less willing and there were, they, there was a, a, I think it was about 15% of the total number said they, would, they turned down people greater than 10 times to, to perform cardiac surgery. Um, uh, in, in this case. And the cardiologist had a harder time finding somebody to do their sicker patients. That's just a, that's a sidebar kind of thing to say public release of information, even though it can look great in the initial JAMA article, which was there, it said this was like the best thing since sliced bread. When you go dig into it a little bit more, there are unintended consequences that come through in terms of access to care and who gets care that we have to look into. So transplantation is much more of a team sport than is the, the notion of cardiac surgery, which is typically a cardiologist refers to a heart surgeon who does something and then sends them back. We are truly a, um, a much more multidisciplinary approach. And the dreaded flag of the worse than expected has lots of different consequences. This is just a look in volume at our current system of what happens to programs which get performed. And so if you, we report overall graft survival, patient survival in either one, and if you just look at the centers which without performance and look at it over a period of time, you can see everybody slowly has sort of been slowly growing. Um, and this, those centers do the next year after the program report comes out, about eight transplants, maybe more a year. But if you get flagged, you can see that the number of transplants done in each one of the centers for whatever reason, either overall graft survival, patient survival, or either one, it falls off over 20 transplants per year going forward. And it affects all aspects of the program. So the number of live donor transplants, which are typically the most predictably good component parts, that goes down um, uh, for almost 15 transplants per year. The standard criteria donors, which are a young deceased donor who gives, a, if you will, almost the perfect organ, it goes up and the, the people who aren't flagged goes down and the people who are flagged and the extended criteria goes down again. So the consequences of being flagged, of being said, ah, 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 makes everybody change. It changes the data. It changes the behavior inside of what you do. This is our most current one that we have that goes up. It says we're actually better than expected, which is a lie. We are exactly the same today as we were yesterday when we were as expected. And it's the capriciousness of how the system is which comes forward. Right now we don't have to worry about the fact that our uh, insurers are, 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 are looking at this data because we look pretty good. But tomorrow we may not look as good. And this is just a, as a, there was an article that was written about, I don't know, maybe five, ten years ago. Um, talking about the consequences of, of data release. So the red dots on this are to show the size of the programs which get flagged. So, and these are, and this isn't not just for, um, this isn't only for the OPTN, for the UNOS one, this is for CMS. So you have to have, out of five cohorts, you have to have two, two periods where you are out of, out of context. You can see there's some big programs in the country which are being flagged and who are actually doing probably reasonably good work, certainly not outside of the realm of what we do. So the question is, so what? I mean, so there are a lot of consequences. The system has and had very good intentions. 
transparency is incredibly important to get to the right answer. But if, to get there, you got to ask the right question. The transparency of data release determines performance, and it changes behavior, just like the New York Cabbage uh, experience did. So the balance is, what do we want to know? How do we get to where we, we are going? The aggregate system, if let's just look at need. Let's start off with the basic stuff. This is out of the USRDS report. And it was the most recent one, but it, so it's always a few years late. There are currently about 450,000 people on dialysis in the country today, okay? And if you look at the number of people who've been transplanted and who are alive and out there walking, it's about 200,000. So it looks pretty good. I mean, we're looking like we're doing pretty well with this. If you're looking at the new people who come on every year on to, who with the need for, for a kidney transplant, or at least the need of kidney support, who are going to either go on dialysis or get transplanted, you can see the biggest group which is rising are the people who are between 45 and 65. So people who are actually in sort of their productive phase of their life in terms of they've gotten the initial jitters out and they're, they're going. But that's the percentage of people which is going up the largest in the country. Um, the, the kids and the young people has been relatively flat, and the, old, the older folks, the 65 and 75 plus, they tend to die off before they, they get uh, to, uh, to, to our system. But what's the chance of living with this disease? And you look at the mortality associated with, um, with, with end-stage renal disease support, and you can see the blue line on top is your death rate in with dialysis, and the yellow line on the bottom is your death rate on with transplantation. It's about a 300-fold increase to go on dialysis of risk of death than it is to get transplanted. And what's the cost? And the, the blue line on the top is the cost of hemodialysis per year. The orange line on the bottom is the cost of transplant per year. And again, it's about a three-fold increase in cost to be treated with dialysis, uh, and if you look at it for peritoneal dialysis, it's about 2.2, 2.3 times the cost to be treated that way. And so the question is that we have two competing therapies. One offers longer life, higher quality, and is cheaper, and the other one offers shorter life, more expensive care, and has a crummier quality of life. Which one should we give to the country, and which one do we accept? And the answer is, you know, it's it's. I won't say pathetic, but it's pathetic. This is the, this is the total number of transplants that we do in a year, 18, a little less than 18,000 uh, transplants. About 12,000 come from uh, deceased donors. Under 6,000 come from live donors. And this is end-stage renal disease care in the country today. The, the, the graph on the far left is the existing cases of, of end-stage renal failure. The one in the next is the new, new additions, the wait list, the new additions to the wait list, transplanted, and then with deceased donors and transplanted with live donors. We are, we are so far away from where we need to be. The question is, why aren't we doing more? And is transparency part of the problem? Information about transplant programs is comparison with other transplant programs, not to the disease itself. And we have set the bar really, really high as to how we do it. This is the current expected, uh, this is the current observed uh, kidney transplant outcomes associated with this. The top line, with the, there's a little yellow thing and the, the black dot, is expected outcomes for one year for a live donor. We're at 97 percent, 3 percent. That's almost lower than your wound infection rate. We're expecting kid people to be alive with a functioning graft at the end of the year. Not only we're expecting, they are alive and out there at the end of the year. Deceased donor grafts are the other one, and it's about 93 percent for both primary and retransplant graphs. Now that is, I don't want to say it's nuts, but it's nuts. That's, we have set our bar way, way, way too hard. So this is, this is the graph up on top which showed the difference between our allocation system which was supposed to make it better. Can you see the difference between those lines? No, you can't. You have to blow it up to the whole thing where you have that whole graph is a 5% difference where you can even start to see a difference in outcomes. What should we be comparing against? Do we compare program against program, or do we compare program against disease? This is an article that was written by Jesse, Jesse Schold comparing the top three lines up there are the best, the best performing programs in the country, 
the middle one is the as expected programs and the bottom one is the worse than expected programs. And you can see that they're nice there and then the other line that goes down the number four, that's the survival on dialysis. Okay, so that it doesn't matter where you go to get your transplanted, particularly if it's at one year, which is where we get all dinged up. Right there is at one year and if you draw it up, you can see the differences between those lines are like that. Statistically, you can say they're different. But if you're a person on dialysis, what do you need to know? You need to know what your survival is if you go to a transplant program. And maybe there are differences between the programs, but you need to know the difference between survival, which looks like that curve, versus the ones which go, go from, um, rather than comparing us program to program. This is currently what we use for deceased donors in the country. You can see that people over the age of 65 are essentially not used as organ donors in the country. Um, the vast majority of what we do come from 18 to 34 year olds. How many 18 to 34 year olds do you know who die? They, there are unfortunately people who do, but if you look at the total deaths in the country, here's the 18 to 34 year olds right there. That's, that's the rest of the folks who are actually, every year we have two, two, a little more than two and a half million people die in the United States. And the question is, how can we do better? We discard a lot of organs. We're not as efficient as we should be. And we could probably make these things work better, but why? If we look at what goes on in Spain, you can look at and see that the number of organ donors who are over the age of 60, which is the, the blue, the, the light blue line and above, you can see that it's half their organ donors are over the age of 60. Unlike in the US where we're well under 10% are, uh, are that age. And if you even look just at the kidney donors, everybody knows kidney function goes down with age. 40% of the kidneys they transplant every year are over the age, are donors over the age of 60. So that it's, there, there are different ways in which people use organs available to them. We have a lot of people who die every year in our country who are over the age of 60. We don't even use their organs. And the reason that we don't use them is because of that little gap at one year for graft survival. Here's the experience with the, with the folks in Spain of using organs over the age of 65. And if you look at that first year, you can see that the survival rate between dialysis and transplantation really isn't all that different. It's a little bit better with transplantation, but not much at the end of the year. And that you're looking at probably five to 10% less good function than what we currently use when we use young organ donors. But look at the benefit that you get after a year. The bottom line is staying on dialysis, age cohort matched of people on the wait list versus the top line, which is getting an organ from an old guy um, and having the initial fall off, but having it function longer. The, the survival benefit is substantial for use, if effective use of organs from older folks. And as you could see, 40% of their kidneys that they transplant were this type of kidney. Now, so what's, what's, how do we get out of this mess? And so this was an article that appeared a few years ago about the effect of systems on outcomes. And it was just said that Asia's skies are mistakes that go unreported or underreported. And so much of what transplantation has been told to be, or all of healthcare, has been pattern yourself af after the FAA patterning yourself after the air industry. And so it was an, actually a really important part of how this goes. It's a culture of whether public release of information, you know that a lot of the FAA stuff is not publicly released until well. The Asian system has a much different approach. I will just leave that there. Um, and that, so that when they compared the system between Asia, three million flights a day, um, or three million flights over a five year period, uh, negligent or uh, drug alcohol was, was, uh, was not involved. Uh, there were 28 major air accidents, 13 serious events, five less serious, which were not mandatory to be reported. In Australia, which has more or less the same European system, same number of flights over the five year period, but rather than having 28 major accidents, they had five. They reported 58 serious events and 74 less serious events. And the consequences of culture and what do you do with the information? And in our system, we have such a diffuse base of where information goes that in fact, 
the, the consequences, we're much more like the Asian system where there are negative consequences anytime you self-report or do something that has a flaw. So we live in an era of enforcement and compliance. Um, it has changed everything from the bottom up. We are relatively quick to, to judge. We, I come from the great state of Minnesota, and I don't know if you remember Cecil the Lion. Um, the fellow who got that was specific reports are really being used to define centers of excellence and drive traffic. Expectations are too high. We have set them for ourselves. We can't get out of it. We cannot use organs which have a little bit less uh, potential function but a whole lot of benefit for our population because we'll then put ourselves into a tailspin and get uh, in a different, uh, f become financially non-viable. And we're trying to figure out a way out of this. The transplant community, the ASTS, the communities at large have been engaging with a lot of different talks with folks, but oftentimes to no avail because it's a fairly complex system and it's all of healthcare is a complex system. So when you try to get to the nuance of it, the whole premise of public information is that it's simple and it's transparent. But in an era of complexity, simplicity is oftentimes the demon. So we live in an era of quality and safety. Uh, it's here to stay. It is not a bad thing to have. It's, it is the result of a good idea. Um, safety and repetition metrics are really good. I mean, if I want to have something done to me, I want to know that it will happen in a predictable and 